Welcome to Pre-Shift, tidbits of wisdom for everyday service. My name is TJ Griffin, and I'm the corporate wine educator for Winebow. We encourage your questions at any point during the webinar, but please use the Q&A rather than the chat bar. Let me introduce your host, Master Sommelier Ron Edwards. He's the husband of one wife, the father of five girls, and a surfer. He has almost 30 years of hospitality experience, and since 2018, he has been the director of wine education for Winebow. And now, here to discuss today's topic, sparkling wine strategies, Master Sommelier, Ron Edwards. Hello, TJ. Hello, everyone out there in the audience. So great to be back on pre-shift. It's been a little while. We had a little pause and a, a delay based on some things going on in the, in the uh, non-pre-shift world. TJ, you doing okay today? Yeah, I'm doing great. We're getting started uh, back on this, uh, on a fun topic. I agree, because it is the the topic of greatest passion for me, perhaps, and that is just the idea of sparkling wine and its usage and why it shouldn't ever be considered really difficult or any of the things that tend to be said about it. And um, so I'm excited to cover this with the audience. And um, all right, well, let's move on. And by the way, everybody... Uh, Really love to be able to see your questions and comments and uh, look forward to any interactions you have. I'm going to just start by the with the idea that, you know, why am I suggesting that we have a sparkling wine strategy? And I think the reality is that if you want to succeed with any effort, having a good strategy is a must. Um, if you want to sell anything, intentionality is a big deal. Uh, you can sell things without being intentional. They just sort of happen but that's not the best way to approach it. So if you want to sell more sparkling wine, and who doesn't? I never actually spoke to a, a restaurateur or worked with any of my clients during my consulting days that wanted to sell less sparkling wine. Um, they always thought, well, I, yeah, I'd like to sell more, but it's too hard, or uh, I'm afraid it'll go bad. And they had all of their you know, logic train behind why it wouldn't work. And, and fear was the main reason that they weren't selling more. And the other was that they didn't have an intentional strategy. So let's create some intentional strategies. I'm going to give you some options of what those strategies might be, but let's start here. Um, this is sort of a representative picture of how I feel about sparkling um, every day that it's available. And it doesn't have to be champagne, it, it, just wine with bubbles is a joy to me and uh, the expression on this person's face and just the the mesmerizing nature of bubbles even though these are you know obviously uh, soap bubbles it still it, it feels that way and the the comment that you know is attributed to Dom Perignon when he opened a bottle that had gone sparkling by accident at that point and he said brothers come I'm tasting the stars I mean it really is such a great experience to have uh, a great glass of bubbly and and set it apart from the normal experience in wine of still wine. TJ, do you feel that way about, about bubbles? I do. And I have a question for you. And this might come out of left field, but I, there is a, a sense of joy, I think, associated with sparkling wine for me and for, I think, a lot of wine drinkers. Mm -hmm. Is that just that we've been programmed to think of that as a celebratory wine? Or do you think there's some actual physical science behind how the bubbles feel on your palate, et cetera? That's a really good question. Uh, I haven't looked into any of the science that might suggest that there's actually a physical response to it. Certainly you can't get away from the concept that, we, that there is that social learning that happens about sparkling wine or coffee or anything else that it gets placed into a context that when you are doing this, you should expect that. So I think that's definitely part of it that we've been conditioned into the idea that uh, having a glass of, of bubbly wine means something good just happened, right? Um, I do, however, feel like all beverages with bubbles have an elevating experience, right? Um, even sparkling water is a different experience drinking it than just flat water. And it feels, I don't know, more special. It feels more refreshing at times for me. Um, so I think that wine with bubbles does have a physical manifestation of creating a smile that isn't necessarily tied to the social learning, but that's not something I can prove yet. I guess I need to do some research and develop on that. On that. <laughs> we'll have to set up a lab with many, many, many samples. 
Oh, yes, I like that part. The many, many samples sounds pretty good, at least. Uh, so anyway, I think that well, let's start our conversation with the idea that no matter where it comes from, sparkling wine creates a different feel to your guest, to your customer in the in the retail space. And because of that, we should be concentrating on the idea that by selling them a bottle of sparkling wine, in some ways we are selling them joy and um, and happiness. And and so let's let's work on that. So why are we doing this? Let me count the ways. I came up with six uh, reasons that you should try to sell more sparkling wine. Um, and reason number one is that in restaurant or retail, and this is a super important reason, and I probably could stop here, but in restaurant or retail, it is rarely the only thing bought when purchased. Yes, that's right. Increase the check average. That's what we want to do. So, I mean, just bringing it into the real world, one of the reasons I pushed so hard to sell sparkling wine, primarily champagne by the glass in restaurants that I either ran full time or consulted for, is that it's almost never the last glass or beverage they order because you get it there early. It doesn't last through the meal. The, you know, nobody wants their sparkling wine to go flat. It's a cold beverage, so you don't want it to get warm. And it just isn't going to sit there throughout the whole meal, which means that you've added a minimum of 12 and a maximum of whatever you can imagine. I mean, you're, if you're selling Krug by the glass, maybe you're selling it for 50 bucks, but most restaurants, you know, somewhere between 12 and $20, you just added to the check average and the person was happy about it. Those are just amazing things. In the retail setting, when people come in and they buy a bottle of sparkling wine, they are often there buying something else or they came to buy something else and you add the sparkling wine to the check. So I really think that you are benefiting yourself because it normally is not the only thing. Reason number two, sparkling wine, and this is kind of what we just talked about. Sparkling wine elevates the experience of the moment. It doesn't matter what the moment is. It could be that I just got home from work. It could be that we are celebrating a birthday. It could be that it's Thursday. Whatever, it takes that moment and elevates it, whether that's social learning or whether it's actually a physical response to bubbly wine. Who cares? Let's capitalize on it. Uh, reason number three, sparkling wine is a growth category. You may not realize this. It's actually a growth category in the US thanks to the rise of Prosecco. Um, we are seeing an increase in sales of sparkling wine, and it was a fairly noticeable increase in sparkling wine sales over the pandemic. Weird, right? No, of course not. Everybody needed a little joy and relaxation during the pandemic to take their mind off of everything else going on. So it makes sense that they might go out and buy a bit more sparkling wine. In addition to that, spritz o'clock became a big thing over the last five years. And so uh, that elevated the purchase of sparkling wine as people were making spritzes at home instead of just getting them in restaurants. Number four, sparkling wine was focused on the on-premise sector prior to COVID, but COVID literally brought sparkling wine home. So now you retailers have an honest effort at being able to put sparkling wine in people's shopping carts and off they go because they used to kind of focus it on wine by the glass in restaurants or, you know, it's a special occasion and we're going to have it at a restaurant. And now it's becoming like an everyday or a weekly kind of option for many people. Uh, again, many thanks to Prosecco for bringing that to reality. Reason number five, beginning in the mid teens price point, you know, that 14 to $16 range retail, there is an absolute quality option for every buyer up through luxury categories in sparkling wine. So you're never forced to give up the dollars of the sale by selling sparkling wine, if that's the only bottle they buy. And reason number six, sparkling inclusions in the cocktail category are a huge help to promotion and usage. So even at the retail level, like if I was running a retail level right now and I had the ability to do so, because not every state will let you, but especially in states that are able to sell wine and spirits, I would have absolutely have a spritz display on an end cap with a few different options in sparkling wine and a few different options in liqueur that make great spritzes. And I would be pushing that like crazy. And then of course, in the, in the restaurant world, there's lots of different cocktails that have sparkling wine in them or are the major for them. And that's another way to support your sparkling wine agenda. 
How are we doing so far, TJ? You tracking with those? Do you have a you have a reason number seven that I didn't think of? Well, there's so many reasons, but those are those are six very good reasons. But uh, Antonio weighed in on our our first discussion about sparkling wine and joy and the associations, and he makes a really good point uh, that sparkling wines are the only wines to give you auditory auditory sensations, which is really interesting because I think our our, our sense of hearing is underutilized when it comes to food and wine in general. That's super fascinating. I love that concept. It's sort of like the uh, Rice Krispies of wine. <laughs> well, I was thinking, what if in our, our fictional yeah, lab that will never, will never come to be, but if you hooked someone up to, you know, what a, a machine to re read their brain waves and you just played the sound of a champagne cork popping, mm -hmm. I bet you would see a positive response in a lot of people. Yeah, or just the sound of that. You know, like the sound that the flute makes as you get it close to your face, as you hear yes. the bowl popping in the flute. Uh, yeah. I know that I would have a positive response to it. It would probably be uh, right up there with the, uh, you know, an Im immediate joy endorphin response from my, from my brain. Yeah. All right. So that's, that's first strategy. It, it, let's get into that one. You got to make it important. If you want to sell anything in your agenda, you have to make it important. So whether the, if you're in the audience and you're one of our wholesale salespeople, if you want to sell sparkling wine, you have to make it an important part of your agenda. If you're a retailer or a restaurateur, it's the same thing. You got to make it an important part of the agenda. So often I see, especially in retail, that sparkling wine is sort of relegated off into a corner away from the popular wines and knowing that if somebody really wants sparkling wine, they'll go find it. Well, that's a guaranteed way to make sure they don't find it or at least find something else before it and then go, yeah, I'm good. And out the door they go. In the case of restaurants, make sure that people walk in and feel like sparkling wine is important here if you want to sell it. And I have some suggestions for that later, but it's going to be different in every place. So first of all, make sure that you make it important. It's a notable part of your approach. I've already given you several reasons why it should be a notable part of your approach. So make sure that you are making it clear to your client that this is an important thing here. All right. Now, let's actually leverage some information that we that I found recently through some very up to date consumer um, polling research. And this was a, a, a information gathered through actual real live wine consumers in the United States, not a bunch of people like me saying, hey, this is what we think is happening out there. And that is the approval rating of a sparkling wine is, is pretty amazing right now. And we can leverage that because people are more open to it than they have been in my professional time. So the research conducted by a group called Vinitrack ha has shown that on average, one third or more, depending on which subject you're talking about, of consumers who drink sparkling wine at least once a year feel that there is very good value in nearly every category of sparkling wine. TJ, that's amazing to me because when I first started selling wine, it was more that people felt like sparkling wine was a bit of a luxury and it was a little more expensive than other things. And I don't really think people saw that there was value in it. Did, did you see that earlier? Did, did you have a different experience with consumers? No, I was surprised to hear that. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that, but I did think, uh, uh, similar to you that, you know, people thought of as a special treat or, or, you know, um, special occasion kind of thing. And it, it may be that because they have been using it for that, they were okay spending a little bit more. And the experience they got out of it said that there was very good value to them. I'm not sure what they were thinking about here, but their confidence. What's really fascinating to me is since 2016 and particularly during the shutdown of the pandemic, their confidence grew in the very good value rating for the following categories. And this is a little long, which is really encouraging. French champagne, there was an increase in the perception of value. Asti, increase. Cava, increase. Sparkling wine from France, meaning anything that isn't champagne, an increase in very good value perception. Prosecco, that one we figured we'd get, right? And then sparkling wine from the US actually got a boost in, um, in consumer confidence that it's a very good value. Rosé bubbles went up in confidence. And 
this one really surprised me, even fruit infused bubbles. So sparkling wines that are infused with cherry or whatever also got a, uh, a boost in confidence for the very good value, which, and on average, none of those, actually none of those dropped below a 33% ratio. And some of them were as high as 39% of the consumer base said that these wines are very good values. What I found interesting was this little outlier of sparkling wine from other countries. So TJ, in our world, that would be everywhere from Tasmania to Austria to uh, Italian sparkling wine would be from other countries, except they pulled out Prosecco and Osti. And um, that, that stayed constant in the very good value rating. It was about 36%. Um, and increased in the good value rating. So the tier right below had a, had a growth period uh, during the last two years, especially. So my suggestion here is, since we now know that this is a reality through statistical data, let's confirm their sense of value in this by pairing the sparkling wines with wines, other wines they find to be of value where they have a positive relationship. So um, pairing them up with wines that have similar cost in a retail setting where it's like a full experience here, uh, take this wine and this wine and the wine that's sitting next to the sparkling wine is something that people perceive as a good value for the quality, but is more regularly purchased than the, than the champagne or the Prosecco or the, you know, pick your favorite thing. Does that make sense? Did I, did I follow a logic train there that, that, that caught up with you? Yeah, I, I wonder, this might be me being cynical, but I wonder if um, folks having to go out off premise and purchasing bottles that they would otherwise maybe only purchase on premise that they see, wow, I can get the whole bottle for $45. Or, <laughs> so instead of the, uh, you know, sometimes exorbitant by the glass pricing that we used to see in on premise settings. I think that that's a, a very high likelihood and, um, and, and a good point. And so, uh, but either way, we can still capitalize on it now, especially at the retail level. Um, and I think we can capitalize it on restaurants too. And uh, the, one of the ways, and we'll talk about one of the ways we can do that. And so this image here is feeding back in on um, this idea of making it important. Strategy three, in on-premise and off-premise, alike, make it feel like an expectation. Like when you come into my business, I expect you to consider sparkling wine. That's, that's an actual legitimate strategy. And then you figure out how do I create that expectation? So in the on-premise, I have a couple of ideas for you. Uh, the strongest, and I have employed this multiple times to great success, is presetting the dining room. Like everybody puts down water glasses or most people do. Preset the glass with a champagne flute. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a fancy restaurant to do this. You know, mid-tier dining can still do this. Um, but presetting on champagne flutes on the tables is a visual clue to the person coming in or a visual, visual cue, more to the point, to the person coming in to sit down that, oh, bubbles, champagne flute, hmm. And it starts a process in their brain that then gets to be reinforced by the server that walks up and says something about, you know, welcome. So glad you're here. We have three sparkling wines by the glass, one legit champagne, one Prosecco, and one local sparkling wine from, pick your favorite reason, region, which one would you like to start with? And then they have to make a decision as to whether or not they want to do that. The other option is alongside of this, and I consider this sort of, um, y yes, they can operate separately, but they operate most powerfully in tandem. And that is on the way into the dining room or in the middle of the dining room, however you're set up, is the sparkling wine by the glass ice tub. And I do mean something that's large enough to hold, you know, five, six, 10 bottles of sparkling wine, where what you're going to serve that evening by the glass, unless it's being used in the bar, is there available to be opened and poured without leaving the dining room. And uh, it says uh, it's another visual cue to the person walking in that, wow, not only are they serious about sparkling wine to put the flute on the table, but they also have it at the ready. Um, I probably had about a 35% success rate of people saying, sure, I'll have a glass of sparkling wine at one restaurant that I worked at where I employed both of these 
ideas and um it was it was great and as as i mentioned before check average immediately goes up when bubbles hit the table in the off-premise concept how about let's create some selling displays that create a whole evening for the buyer the sparkling as a part of the equation you know it's like hey um it's Thursday. So how about a, a, a bottle of Prosecco to get you started, save it for Friday when you're done. And here's your regular wine that goes with you for that. Or it's Friday evening and it's a, a bottle of champagne followed by the, by the ever popular Cabernet, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, whatever, and put in multiple options where people who like different styles of wine can then latch onto a, a full plan for an evening, plan out the evening for the client. Uh, and put it right in front of them where they have to make a decision. And then if you happen to be working in one of the uh, off-premise locations that also does groceries or food to go, just make the whole meal, set it all out. Uh, here's all the ingredients and the recipes. If you don't have a food to go option with the wine that matches, or the, uh, here's the entire meal, take it home, heat up what's, what's need, needed to be heated and open these wines and have a, have a restaurant-like experience without leaving home. Because with all the delivery services and with people getting, now they're going back out to restaurants now for sure, but there's still some hesitance and there's still some like, there's this beauty that people are like, wow, I can have sort of a restaurant experience at home. So feed into that. And by the way, restaurants who are doing heavy to go ordering still put champagne in the options. If you're allowed to send alcohol home with people, uh, why not? It's a great idea. All right. Strategy four, unless TJ, you have anything, just making sure you have the opportunity to jump in if you if you need. Good. All right, fabulous. Strategy four. And we've talked about this before, TJ, when we talked about Greece and having Greek wines on menu and anything else that's a little out of the ordinary, and that is one is nothing. If you want to reinforce that your consumer base isn't really interested in whatever you think they're not interested in, offer one. And your lack of interest in it will translate straight into their lack of interest in it, and it will get ignored. So if you want to, uh, if you want to sell uh, Greek wine, you better have more than one. If you want to sell champagne, you should have more than one. If you want to sell sparkling wine by the glass, you have to have more than one option uh, because it says it's important by having a focus on it, right? And don't and you say, well, I have to have three Chardonnays. Why do you have to have three Chardonnays? Because you have to represent all three styles, because you have to represent three different price points, why is it that you have to have three Chardonnays? Well, it's important to the customer. Okay, maybe it is, but it'll never be important to the customer unless they have options. Um, and there's some reasons behind that. So for, for the on-premise account, you need to have at least two options in sparkling wine by the glass and then feed into a larger list of sparkling wines by the bottle. And I would encourage you, figure it out. Figure out how to sell a legit champagne by the glass all the time. Yes, I know cost is an issue. We're going to get to that in a little bit. But when you're entertaining someone who likes sparkling wine and you say, well, I have a sparkling wine by the glass, it's XYZ, not champagne. Someone like me will look down and go, I'm not really into that Cava or that Prosecco tonight, or I'm not really into that. Uh, Napa Valley version or whatever. I really wanted a glass of champagne. And even though I am absolutely in favor of all those categories in a restaurant, I will often not order that alternate option because I'm just, I just want a really high quality one glass experience, or I'll turn around and order something else um, by the bottle, maybe if, if we're all lucky. So by offering champagne, you have catered to the ultimate sparkling wine consumer. And that is the one who's willing to spend 18 to $25 on a glass of sparkling wine, i.e. champagne. The other, and then the other end of it, if you're, if you're only gonna offer two, the other one then has to fit into your bar program as well. You have to be able to use it to make your spritzes and cocktails and things like that. I recommend go for it, man, have three and have something in the middle tier. I think the middle tier is where you get to play with uh, something that's regional, like, uh, you know, TJ in your area, it would be really cool to have New York based sparkling wine. When I was in Michigan, I tend to have uh, at all times a Michigan based sparkling wine producer as one of my glass pour options. Um, if I was in California, I would have a California option. 
if I was in the mid in, anywhere where you don't have local, then you, the oy, the world's your oyster, and just have one of these other country categories that isn't the most common. And that's where we introduce people to things that are, are delicious um, and aren't the exact sparkling wine they've always heard of. For off-premise accounts, I think you need to just keep your variety relevant but not excessive. And I would say try not to pro poach your price point so much. You know, if you're going to offer champagnes, don't make don't have twelve that are all within three dollars of each other, um, and uh, go from there. Um, so that when people come in there, if they feel like there's an actual logic train behind why they should spend sixty dollars for this one and fifty for that one. Um, I realize that uh, I am not speaking the same language as many retailers in that regard, but I have consulted for some retail shops that were successful by not poaching pricing. All right, next is the idea of supporting the fact that the consumer thinks, as we have established through actual scientific methods, that there is very good value in sparkling wine. So this is simple. Take a lower profit margin on, sp on sparkling wine to increase the consumer confidence in purchase. All right. So if you give the consumer the impression that you're making a little less money on sparkling wine for their benefit of ordering it, it'll actually increase their confidence in your entire offering, not just their sparkling wine. It'll also more than likely get that purchase happening. And as we talked about before, it's probably not the last thing they're going to purchase. So you get an added purchase perhaps at a lower profit margin, but that's okay because it's very easy to make up your profit margins on Cab, Chard, Pinot, and Pinot Grigio, especially in on-premise. Uh, off-premise is a little different animal where everything is very transparent these days because uh, you can in your open up wine.com and see what the world thinks this is supposed to cost. But that actually is an advantage to you as the retailer because they can obviously see that you're offering them a better value for that wine. So reinforce their idea of very good value by offering them a very good value. And my final strategy for today, although we could probably think of some other ideas, and that is purely for the on-premise category. Use flutes. Stop it. Stop telling me you have to have a white wine glass for your champagne. That's a personal preference. I'm not talking about personal preference or style, and I'm, I'm not even going to get into the idea of well, it smells better out of a wine glass than it does out of a flute. That's not the point. This is about money. This is about dollars and profit and perceived value in the eyes of the consumer. A flute, like these are really good examples that I found this picture of because this is a very elegant looking beverage. The pour is pretty nice, except for that next to the last glass where they got all crazy and over poured it. But that, that pour right there is probably a four ounce glass of sparkling wine that looks full and generous. That means you get six glasses out of a bottle. Now, the rest of your glass pour program, you're not getting six glasses out of a bottle. So the right flute choice, and you choose them carefully, gives you the option of pouring four to four and a half ounces in a glass of champagne instead of five to six ounces, which is the norm for most people's glass pour programs on premise. But here's the, here's the magic. You still calculate your glass pour cost as if you were pouring five or six ounces. And in the process, you will be able to offer a different kind of champagne or sparkling option to your guests because you know that your profit margin is more flexible and it will cover some of your uh, fear of loss uh, where you feel like a bottle is going to go flat. And uh, it will also um, just boost what's going on. And in the end, if you have a consumer that comes in and says, well, I just won't drink my bubbles out of a flute, it's easy enough to measure it out and pour them in a glass. They're gonna look at the glass that you put the white wine in normally with the bubbles in it, and they're gonna complain that you didn't pour them enough wine. And that's a big deal. And that's one of the reasons I never used standard wine glasses for champagne service. Although I know it's very in vogue because it saves you from buying another glass. The, the uh, couple of cases that you need to purchase for champagne flutes is a minor incurred cost for the resulting profit margin over the long term. Hopefully nobody feels scolded, but nonetheless, that you know, we have to sometimes set aside our personal passions in, in lieu of the dollars in the bank. TJ, what you got? 
Do you think uh, this is more off premise, I guess, but that's important because as we saw, uh, trends are increasing off premise, but do you think there are still people who avoid buying sparkling wine because they're afraid to open it? Absolutely. Is there anything we can do to help them? Or just something I can do to help them. I should record a video and make it more readily available. Um, I think that in, that's another thing in dining rooms, by the way, is please train your people to open sparkling wine properly. And if you're not absolutely certain that you're doing it right, you can go back to one of our pre-shift courses um, way, way back, like year one, there's actually the process of opening outlined verbally. Um, and most people don't do it correctly. So you probably do need to go look at that. Um, yeah, maybe there is a, that's an interesting question. How could we overcome that hurdle? Videos running as a demo right in front of the champagne section of somebody opening sparkling wine successfully. Yeah, I was maybe. thinking of something like that too. Yeah. Um, or uh, a QR code um, that you hand out to the to the consumer every time they buy one. It's like like goes in the bag and it says, hey, click on this QR code and it'll show you how to open this wine safely. Well, that would be interesting too. And, 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 and could, pretty cost effective. Be, yeah, very cost effective. You don't need the uh, the video display in the section that way. But um, maybe that's my next business model, TJ. You just brought up a brilliant idea. <laughs> uh, there are videos on YouTube of how to do it, uh, although I can't I can't vouch for all of them uh, doing it properly. Uh, and do not go accidentally looking up the sabering videos because that's definitely not what we <laughs> want to encourage people to no. do. You talked about <laughs> pricing real quick. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, back when I was in sales, and it was a while ago, but it wasn't, you know, too long ago, I still had buyers asking me, I really like the sparkling wine, whatever it was, uh, does it come in splits because I have too much waste when I, uh, you know, open a full bottle. Mm -hmm. Is that still an issue with all the technology we have now that uh, from, from Corb and sparkling wine just to little stoppers and stuff like that, is that still an issue for on-premise? Um I don't think it was an issue for on-premise back then um, because when people were asking you those questions, I was running very successful sparkling wine by the glass programs where right. I almost never threw wine away. Um, it's own, uh, So let me reiterate something I said earlier. That is a problem when it isn't your strategy and your intention to sell sparkling wine. Mm -hmm. When it's an afterthought, if people want it, I have it, then yes, loss is a problem and splits are a good idea. So if you're not really going to buy into this idea that sparkling wine deserves attention and intentionality, then yes, you're going to, you're going to throw wine away. But now to the second half, uh, Verre de Vin, uh, the, uh, the pneumatic vacuuming, uh, mechanism also has the other spout attached to it is a gas charge for sparkling wine. So that is one thing that you could buy for a restaurant, especially that if you wanted to, you know, expand your sparkling wine options with with less risk uh, i had a client that did that it was very successful um they didn't ever lose sparkling wine because it basically put it back to six atmospheres of pressure when you when you finish pouring it um the idea of coravin yeah if you want to get into let's pour people super legit sparkling wines, vintage Franciacorta, you know, great champagne houses, et cetera, and not run the risk of much spoilage, then yes, the new Coravin process for sparkling wines would be a, a good option for you. And if you're already doing a Coravin program for your higher tier wines by the glass, then it fits right in beautifully. Um, I, I think in most cases, you don't have to go in and, and increase your investment in equipment you have to increase your investment in awareness and the commitment among your staff to be as sold out on getting sparkling wine in people's glasses as you are. And that, that in of itself will overcome almost all of the waste issues that you see. We have a question, Ron. Um, selling sparkling wine at dinner versus brunch. Hmm. Meaning, is it different? I guess, I guess that's what they're asking. Is it the uh, brunch is so easy with like mimosas and stuff like that, but that you're really talking about like sparkling wine cocktails. Um, mm -hmm. So Good I question. guess, I guess the different, yeah, they're asking, is it a similar strategy? Is it a different strategy? 
we don't talk about brunch too often, but it's an important uh, yeah, it's, money maker for a lot of folks. Yeah, it's huge for many restaurants that are open for that Saturday and Sunday brunch. Um, I don't think that the strategy is really that different um, because one of the interesting thing about brunch is people come in, those who are going to, let me, let me narrow this scope a little bit, right? Those who are going to drink at brunch, which is not all of your consumers, right? Not even people who would normally drink wine for dinner. There's a subset of that crowd that will drink wine at lunch for whatever reason or brunch, right? And of those crowds, you can still appeal to them the same way. This, you, can, you probably aren't going to sh preset champagne flutes at brunch unless you have this concept of mimosas or whatever that are at the sideboard and the server just takes them over and pours them for people who want mimosas. And right next to that would be your champagne bucket display where you can have, yeah, we have mimosas and you, and you know we're famous for those or, or whatever your sparkling wine cocktail is for your brunch. But you can also just have great sparkling wine if that's what you want. I think you could leverage that sort of uh, structure in your promotion. It's still about intentionally making sure people know it's available. And the big conversation, the, the last client I had as a full-time restaurant client offered three meals a day every day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day of the week during the summertime. And so there was always this conversation between myself and the daytime staff about bring it up. Don't assume that the table in front of you isn't interested in anything from the bar or isn't interested in a glass of sparkling wine or a mimosa or any of the other things that we offer, bring it up. Let them tell you they're not interested. And I think that's really the magic at brunch is that without being put overly pushy and without making people feel shame because they don't want to drink at lunch because there's that line you have to be careful but bring it up talk about it make sure people are aware of the choices that they can make that makes a lot of sense so what do we have coming up I, this is an intriguing topic support post nominals all right so uh if that's a weird term for my, many of you i have a post nominal uh, right after my s in edwards there's a comma and then ms standing for master sommelier. Um, you know, it could also stand for a master's of science, but I have a bachelor's in that instead. <laughs> um, the, the idea of the hospitality and retail trade should be supporting the uh, professional growth of their employees through post-nominal work, the WSET program, court of master sommeliers, or, you know, there's all different kinds of versions, the certified uh, wine educator, the uh, society of wine educators, all of them have value to bring to the table. And the reality is how do we support that in the midst of a very expensive business of hospitality and is there value? So that's, that's sort of the conversation we're going to have. Well, it's, um, it's an interesting topic and I see at least one of our attendees is, uh, sporting some post novels. I suspect there's more. Cool. Um, so I'm very interested in that and, uh, I look forward to it. Join us then two weeks from today, same time, 11 a.m. on Tuesday, October 19th for support post nominals on pre-shift. And as always, you can alternate weeks with us on the Bordeaux show, which is coming to a close in the next few weeks. Uh, and next Tuesday, the 12th, we'll be talking about uh, the vintages of Bordeaux. So join us for that. Yeah, we're going to talk about all the vintages of Bordeaux in one 30-minute session, huh, TJ? Yes. We're going to start in 1855, and then yeah, we're just going yeah. to do one every minute until we get to the one a minute. Oh, then all we would be doing is naming the vintages. <laughs> I think we'll. I'll, I'll end up being a little more selective than that. All right. we'll 1856. <laughs> Good. 1857. Eh. 1865. Good. <laughs> drink, drink or hold. Yeah, or there you go. That would be a trip and painful on both sides of that. All right. So I'm excited to talk vintages. That's cool because they do matter in, in the sales environment. All right. Thanks for joining us, everybody. And we will see you next time.